Okay. Hi, everybody. It's Professor Mitchell. Uh, today we're starting Chapter 5, which is uh, more about probability. In this section, or in this chapter, we're going to do uh, Introduction to Probability Distributions. That's what we're going to do today. And then after that, we will talk about some specific probability distributions, namely the binomial distribution, which is a lot of fun, and then the Poisson probability distribution. Okay. All right, so uh, we're going to start off with some vocabulary. We're going to talk about random variables, uh, probability distributions, probability histograms. And then we're going to talk about how to find the mean standard deviation and variance for a probability distribution, and then talk about whether outcomes are significantly high or significantly low. Okay, So quite a bit to do in this section. All right, so a random variable is a variable typically represented by x, although I do sometimes use y or some other letter, uh, that has a single numerical value determined by chance for each outcome of a procedure. So the example we're going to be talking about here uh, pretty soon, we're going to flip a coin two times and X is going to stand for the number of times that heads comes up. Okay. So that's a good example of a random variable. It has a single numerical value determined by chance. Okay. And then a probability distribution is a description that gives the probability for each value of the random variable. So going back to that example I just mentioned, if you flip a coin two times, and X is the number of heads, uh, X is going to be either zero, one, or two, right? Because heads could come up no times, it could come up one time, or it could come up both times, right? Zero, one, or two. Uh, probability distributions are expressed either in the form of a table, a formula, or a graph, all right? So a probability histogram would be an example of a, of a graph. Okay. And I have examples to show you uh, using both tables and formulas. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, we have talked in the past about the difference between discrete and continuous uh, data. So what I like to say is that discrete answers the question, how many? Continuous answers the question, how much? Okay. So 99 times out of 100, something is discrete if it's uh, whole numbers only, okay? So a collection of values that is either finite, there's a limited number of them, or countable, and what they mean by countable is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, blah, 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 blah. There might not be any you know, conceivable end to it. Um, but, but that's kind of the idea. So if you can describe it with whole numbers, it's discrete. If it can be described any value along an interval, that's called continuous. All right, so anything where you might need fractions or decimals, that's called uh, continuous. Okay, anything along a spectrum. All right, so now we get to some requirements of a probability distribution. Uh, every probability distribution must satisfy each of the following three requirements. Number one, there is a numerical random variable X and its number values are associated with corresponding probabilities, okay? So let's say I'm flipping one coin and I want to, and I just want to know, did the coin come up heads or tails? All right. If I made the outcomes heads and tails, that would not be a random, that would not be a probability distribution. However, if I made tails zero and I made heads one, uh, then that would be okay. All right. The outcomes have to be numerical. They can't be categorical. All right. Uh, number two, the sum of the probabilities has to equal one. So when you list all the possible values of your random variable and you add all those probabilities together, they have to add up to one, okay? 
Now, sometimes the probabilities are rounded off a little bit. And so it is possible that your probabilities will add up to something really close to one, like 0.999 or 1.001. Okay, if, they come, if the sum comes out to be that close to one, it's probably just because of rounding. Okay. But if it came out to 1.2 or 0.75, uh, then that's probably something wrong with that. Okay, so numerical outcomes, probabilities add up to one. And then each individual probability has to be between zero and one, right? That's not a new requirement. We talked about that in chapter four. Uh, a probability always has to be a number between zero and one, okay? So those are your three requirements for a probability distribution. And now, uh, let's see, are we ready to look at some examples? I think so. Okay, so here's the example that I mentioned a couple minutes ago. So you toss two coins and the random variable X is the number of heads, the number of times heads comes up. Okay. So that is a random variable because its numerical values depend on chance. Okay. And they're giving me this probability distribution in the form of a table. Okay. So um, it's not too hard to actually convince yourself that these values are correct. Um, I, I think maybe we won't get into that right now because I just, I, all I want to do is convince you that this is a valid probability distribution, okay? Number one, X has numerical values. Number two, these three probabilities do add up to one. See that? And number three, each of these individual values is between zero and one. Okay, so I, I uh, got a little ahead of myself again. Uh, here's just what you heard me say a moment ago about that table that we were just looking at satisfies the uh, conditions for a probability distribution. So the, var the variable X is numerical. The uh, probabilities add up to one and each individual probability is between zero and one. And then the last thing to point out about this uh, random variable is that it is discrete. It only has three possible values. Uh, three is a finite number, so that automatically makes it discrete. The only time that you really have to think a little harder about whether something is discrete or continuous is when there's an infinite possible number of values. Infinite number of possible values still could be discrete or could be continuous. It kind of depends on what the values look like, right? But a good rule of thumb, it's not perfect, is that if all the infinitely many values were whole numbers, it's still discrete, okay? But if it's like any real number between zero and 10, that would be continuous. All right, so here is that same probability distribution uh, presented as a histogram. So notice uh, the three values, zero, one, and two. Over here, uh, we're used to thinking of this vertical scale as maybe like a relative frequency. Uh, this is similar, it's just that this probability is a theoretical probability. So this would, um, these probabilities are not based on actually tossing two coins a million times and you know keeping track of how, uh, how many heads came up each time. If I did it that way, it would look a little different, okay? Because it probably wouldn't be exactly 50% of the time I got one head. Uh, it would be pretty close though, okay? <clears throat> All right, this is interesting. Uh, you can give a probability distribution as a formula. So they've cooked up this formula, P of X, which stands for the probability of X, is one over two minus X factorial times X factorial. And they're saying X can be either zero, one, or two. Okay. So what we can do is see, okay, well, when I plug in zero and then plug in one and then plug in two, what do all those probabilities come out to? 
Uh, so I have actually done that here. If I plug in zero, just replace every X with a zero. I don't know if you can see that my zeros are in red. I wanted to make them stand out a little bit. Um, two minus zero factorial is two factorial, which is two. Uh, zero factorial is one. Remember, that's like a special definition. And then two is just two. So this comes out to one over two times two times one, which is one fourth. That's the same 0.25 that we had in the table. Okay. Spoiler alert, this formula gives you the same probability distribution that we have in the table. It's the same one. Okay. P of one, if I replace X with one, uh, two minus one is one, one factorial is one. One factorial is still one, two is still two. One over two times one times one is one half. That's your 0.5. And then if you replace X with two, here is your zero factorial, which is one. Here's your two factorial, which is two. One over two times one times two is one fourth. That is 0.25. Okay, uh, hiring managers were asked to identify the biggest mistakes that job applicants make during an interview. And the table below is based on their responses. Does the table below describe a probability distribution? So think about your three requirements for a probability distribution and see if you think that uh, those three requirements are okay. All right, so if you're watching the video, I'm going to ask you to pause it here and just think about it for a second, and then we'll compare notes. Okay, so hopefully you identified that there are actually two problems uh, with that table that we were just looking at. One problem is that the outcomes are not numerical. They are categorical, right? Being late, inappropriate attire, uh, those are categorical responses. And then the other problem is that the uh, probabilities don't add up to one, okay? And that's probably because they gave the respondents uh, the option to pick more than one answer, okay? So it said what, 50% uh, said inappropriate attire, 44% said being late. There were probably some people that put both of those answers, okay? So it's a good survey, it's just not a good probability distribution. All right. Okay. Parameters of a probability distribution. So hopefully you remember from chapter one, the difference between a parameter and a statistic. Parameters are about populations. Statistics are about samples. Think of probability distributions as populations. It's giving you the entire population of possible outcomes. So our mean and our variance and our standard deviation for probability distributions are going to be parameters. So we're going to use parameter notation. For example, we're going to uh, use mu to stand for the mean. So this is telling you how to calculate the mean for a probability distribution, okay? And of course, we're gonna do an example. So picture your table. You have all your different X's and you have your corresponding P of X's. What this formula is telling you to do is to multiply each X by its corresponding P of X and then add all of those products together. And when you add all those products together, you get the mean of the probability distribution. It's just like doing a weighted mean. If you remember weighted means from, uh, I guess that would have been chapter three. Okay. And then uh, we're giving you two different formulas for the variance. Just like in chapter three, there's one formula that kind of does a better job of getting at the heart of what the variance means. But then there's another formula that is easier to use. Okay. So what I've done uh, in the example coming up, 
I added some slides that use this formula okay. uh, in the original version of this PowerPoint they did this problem what, what they're going to do they're getting ready to ask you to find the mean and the variance of a probability distribution uh, they did it they didn't show a ton of work I thought they could have done a better job showing their work so I did it using this formula they actually used this formula. So you, you, you kind of get a chance to see both coming up here. Okay. All right. And here they have a formula for the standard deviation. I think it's easier to just remember that the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Okay. So they wrote it in terms of the second formula. Uh, it would also work with the, with the first version. Okay. Standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Sometimes I just write that like this. Okay, that's a little simpler. All right, uh, expected value. Expected value is just another name for the mean. Okay, I'm actually not a huge fan of the term expected value. I do use it because it's a very common term. I think every book uses this term. Um, but it might give you a false impression that the expected value is uh, the value of the random variable that's the most likely to come up. That is not necessarily true, all right? In fact, you could have a random variable whose possible values are, say, 0, 1, and 2, but the expected value is 1.2, which is not even a possible value, let alone expected. Um, what this is really saying is that if you did if you uh, did your experiment a whole bunch of times and then averaged all the results together, the average would come out to be close to that expected value. All right, but it means the same exact thing as the mean. Okay. Um, now they're writing it as e. I'm more used to writing it as e of x. All right, because it depends on the random variable that you're talking about. All right, so this is using function notation here, the expected value of x. Okay. All right, so now we get to our example. So here is the same probability distribution that we were just looking at. Uh, x is the nut, is uh, the experiment is you're tossing a coin two times. And X is the number of heads that come up, the number of times heads comes up. And they want me to find the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation. Okay. All right, so let's do the mean first. Okay, I hope you can uh, follow this. I added this. So here is your, probab your original probability distribution. Now, normally when I do this, I would just make this one single column. I'm just kind of showing my work here. So this x times p of x, I'm just doing 0 times 0 0.25 is 0. And 1 times 0 0.5 is 0.5. And 2 times 0 0.25 is 0 0.5. Okay. So when I add those values all together, uh, it comes out to 1. Okay, which means the mean of this random variable is one, as in one head. And I wrote 1.0 because they're using the same rounding rule that they have other times they've done mean and standard deviation, one more decimal place uh, than you have in the original data. Okay, so now we move on to um, variance. So over here, I just capped my work for the uh, mean, okay? So uh, hmm, maybe it would have been a good idea to put the formula for variance on here. So let me just scribble that behind me real quick. I'm gonna use the easier formula, which was the second one. So that's the one where you go the sum of the x squared times p of x, and then you subtract u squared. And I think here I am going to use the square brackets. Okay. 
All right, so I'm gonna put in an x squared column. So if x is zero, one, and two, then x squared is zero, one, and four. Uh, and now I'm gonna do x squared times p of x. Let me bring up my pen here. Okay, so I'm multiplying this column by this column. Okay, so zero times 0.25, I wrote that over here. One times 0.5 is 0.5. And then four times 0.25, that comes out to one. Okay. So when I add up the x squared times p of x's, they add up to 1.5. Now that's not the variance yet uh, because the formula says, oh, you know what? I think I do have the formula on here. I click. Yes. So here's the formula. So this part, bring up my pen again. This part right here came out to 1.5. Okay. And then remember from the last part where we found the mean, the mean came out to one. Uh, so that goes in for mu. Okay. 1.5 minus one squared is 1.5 minus one. That comes out to 0.5. And the units for the variance would be heads squared. As weird as that sounds. Okay. <coughs> All right, so then the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. And again, I'm rounding everything to one decimal place. So to one decimal place, the square root of 0.5 is 0.7. So the standard deviation of this random variable is 0.7 heads. Okay, so uh, here is another version of that uh, table. So this is the one that came with the PowerPoint. So he's using the first version of the formula for uh, variance. This kind of looks exactly like what, um, what I showed you already. Uh, but this is using the other formula. So I personally, if I had done it this way, I would have broken this into more columns. I probably would have made this about three separate, or yeah, three separate columns. So uh, you have your x, which is zero, one, or two. And then you have mu, which you found over here. Uh, you square that difference. Remember that square will never ever come out to be negative. And then multiply it by the corresponding probability, okay? So those come out to 0.25, zero, and 0.25, and you get the same value for your variance. Okay, the variance is still 0.5 head squared. Okay. okay, so at the bottom here, they're just putting the mean is one, the variance is 0.5, and the standard deviation is 0.7. They're rounding it to one decimal place. Okay. So on the last slide, I think they're just gonna, yeah, they're just attaching the units now. The mean number of heads is one head, the variance is 0.5 heads squared, the standard deviation is 0.7 heads, okay? And then down here, they're pointing out that the expected value is the same thing as the mean, okay? All right. Okay, identifying significant results with the range rule of thumb. You're gonna see a lot of things on the next few slides that you have already heard in um, probably chapter three and maybe a little bit of chapter four, okay? So anything that is more than two standard deviations below the mean is considered significantly low. Anything that is more than two standard deviations above the mean is considered significantly high. Anything within two standard deviations, they call those not significant. I call them not unusual. Okay, so here's an example uh, using that significant results stuff. We found that when tossing two coins, the mean number of heads is one and the standard deviation is 0.7. 
Use those results and the range rule of thumb to determine whether two heads is significantly high. Okay, Determine whether two heads is significantly high. So what we're going to do is just figure out what value of heads would be two standard deviations above the mean. And then we're going to see whether two heads uh, is above that value or not. So using the range rule of thumb, the outcome of two heads is significantly high if it is greater than or equal to mu plus two sigma. Mu is one, sigma is 0.7. So mu plus two sigma comes out to one plus two times 0.7, which comes out to 2.4. So a significantly high number of heads would be 2.4 or more. Well, of course, two heads is not more than that. Okay. So two heads would not be significantly high. Actually, in this particular experiment, it's impossible to get a significantly high number of heads, right? Because the only possible values are zero, one, and two. You can't get more than two. Okay. And I have a feeling it would be the same thing for uh, zero, right? Zero would not be significantly low. Okay. And that's and that makes sense. You get two heads 25% of the time. That shouldn't be significant. Okay. All right, speaking of that, um, we talked about something like this in chapter four, I think. And I'm kind of looking forward to um, being able to make a little more sense of this. So the last time I talked about this, the idea or the Example that I came up with off the top of my head was rolling a die. Okay, so let's say I roll an ordinary six sided die a hundred times, and I'm interested in how many times does it come up uh, one. Okay. So, and let's say that it came up one 25 times, 25 times out of a hundred, and I want to know is that unusually high? Okay, well, it would be unusually high if the probability of that happening was 0.05 or less. Okay. So someday in the pretty near future, I am going to show you how to find the probability that when you roll a six-sided die, you get uh, the number one come up at least 25 times. That's something I will be able to show you before too much longer. So if that probability comes out to be 0.05 or less, then we would say that 25 times is a significantly high number. I would actually expect one to come up about 16 or 17 times if I rolled the die 100 times. Okay. Same idea for significantly low number of successes. Let's say that the next time I do that experiment, I'm interested in how many times do I roll a six? And let's say that I roll a six eight times, okay? I was expecting 16 or 17, but I got eight. Is that a significantly low number? Well, I don't know right off the top of my head. It would be if the probability of rolling a six uh, eight or fewer times is 0.05 or less then that would be considered significantly low. Okay. All right, and then we also talked about this rare event rule back in chapter four. We didn't talk about it very much. If under a given assumption, the probability of a particular outcome is very small and the outcome occurs significantly less or significantly greater than what we expect with that assumption, we conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. So I think the example that I talked about with this was I roll my die 100 times, and my assumption is this is an ordinary die, okay? So let's say that I roll the die 100 times and the number one comes up 30 times, 30 times, okay? The probability of it coming up that many times is probably pretty low, and so, Maybe what's happening is this is not an ordinary six-sided die. Maybe it has a number one on two faces instead of one, all right? That would cause it to come up more, a lot more than 
what you would expect, right? Okay. Uh, we'll probably talk about this uh, more a little later. Okay. Uh, expected value again, the expected value of a random variable is the same thing as the mean. So you find it the same way that you find the mean. Okay. All right, here comes a fun example. You have $5 to place on a bet in the Golden Nugget Casino in Las Vegas, and you have narrowed your choice to one of two bets. Uh, you're either going to bet on the number seven in roulette. We talked about roulette once before, I remember. Or you're going to play craps, and you're going to bet on the pass line in craps. Okay. So um, I did a little bit of research on craps. I have never played craps in my life. Okay. Uh, the probability of winning this bet, betting on the pass line, is 244 out of 495. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to find your expected winnings if you play roulette. Okay. And then I'm going to ask you to find your expected winnings if you play craps. And then we're going to compare the two and see which one, uh, which one is more likely to make me some money. Okay. So here is how it works for roulette. So remember uh, that roulette, there are 38 different numbers, right? One through 36, and then there's a zero and a double zero. So there's 38 different numbers. The probability of not uh, getting a seven then is 35 out of 38, 37 out of 38, I'm sorry. But the probability of winning and making a net gain of $175 is one out of 38. Okay. Uh, actually, they hand you $180, but the, so the, but the net gain is $175 because you had to, play, you had to pay $5 to play. Okay. So we're gonna find the expected value if you bet $5. Okay. And then I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing for craps. Okay. All right, so that looks like this. There are two possibilities, either you lose, in which case your outcome is negative $5. That happens with probability 37 out of 38. Or you win and you, uh, your outcome is 175, that's your net gain. And that happens with probability one out of 38. Okay. So if you multiply, let me bring up my pen here. If you multiply negative five times 37 out of 30, 37 over 38, it comes out to this number, negative 4.868, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And if you multiply uh, 175 times one over 38, that comes out to 4.605, blah, blah, blah. So now if you add these two together to the nearest penny, that comes out to negative 26 cents, okay? And what that really means is if you make this bet over and over and over a whole bunch of times, on average, you are going to lose 26 cents each time. Okay, so now we're gonna do the same thing with craps. If you bet $5 on the pass line in craps, the probability of losing $5 is 251 out of 495. And the probability of making a net gain of $5 is 244 over 495. Okay. So they actually hand you $10, but you had to pay $5 to play. So it's a net gain of $5. So the question is, which of those two bets is better in the sense of producing higher expected value? So if you're watching the video, I'm going to ask you to pause it and try to make the expected value table for the craps game. And uh, then we'll compare that to the roulette one and we'll see which one is better in the long run. Okay. So we'll check back and compare notes. Okay, 
So here are your two outcomes, negative five and five. You lose $5 with probability 251 over 495. So if you multiply this by this, you get this. And if you multiply this by this, you get this. And when you add those two together, it comes out to negative seven cents. Negative seven cents. Okay. So if you play roulette a whole bunch of times, betting $5 on one number, on average, you're gonna lose 26 cents each time. If you bet $5 on the pass line in craps, you're going to, on average, lose seven cents each time, okay? So, the interpretation of that is, um, you're better off losing seven cents than 26 cents. So the craps game is better in the long run as in you're not going to lose as much money. However, what I said to my class last night is if you are stuck in Vegas and you don't have a way home and you're down to your last $5 and the only way you're gonna get money to get home is to win it, uh, you better play roulette, all right? <laughs> because the best thing you can hope to happen in craps is you know win another five dollars okay so that's not going to help you get home 